Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Penny Horn. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Student Life and Learning here, and it's my absolute delight to welcome you to the university this afternoon. It's a particularly warm welcome to all of our previous students who are with us today. It's such a great pleasure to welcome all of you who trained to be teachers at St. Catharines, Christ and Notre Dame Colleges. As graduates of the colleges, you're all very important members of the Liverpool Hope community and of its alumni. As you may have gathered, Liverpool Hope University is celebrating its 175th birthday this year. And this ceremony is a really central part of those celebrations. We're here today to celebrate your success, to mark long careers in education, and to say thank you for your commitment to supporting and encouraging young people. To recognize these achievements, we've invited you here today to make the award of an honorary Bachelor of Education to each and every one of you, and to 400 more of your colleagues who can't be with us this afternoon. Before we commence the formalities, I thought it would be helpful to introduce you to the people who are here with me on the platform. So in the center of the platform, we have our Vice Chancellor and Rector, Professor Gerald Pile. To his right is Reverend Canon Peter Wynne, who is the Pro-Chancellor and Chair of University Council. That's the Chair of the University's governing body. Alongside them are Professor Ian van der Waal, Pro Vice Chancellor Operations and Dean of Arts and Humanities, the Reverend Canon Professor Newport, PVC Academic and Dean of Education, and Professor Atulia Naga, the Dean of Science. We'll also be joined on the platform by a number of special guests during the ceremony. To open our ceremony formally, I would like to ask our university chaplain to call us to prayer. Thank you. Please stand. God of wisdom, we pray for our graduates who have dedicated themselves to the education of young people. We thank them for their passion for the truth and for kindling it in others. We value their wisdom. May they continue to use this to guard your children in their care. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord and true teacher. Amen. I've already introduced you to our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Gerald Pile. Professor Pile has led the truly astonishing development of this university over the last few years. I'm privileged to be able to ask him to address you this afternoon. Professor Pile. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Pro-Chancellor, distinguished colleagues and friends. I must say that um, it's a special delight to be able to welcome you to the university this afternoon. We have graduations here in winter and summer, and we get quite used to them over the years, but there's never been a graduation quite like this one. Never before have we had such a distinguished group of people who actually were here before I came and, were here and, and studied here before many of us on the present staff um, arrived in Liverpool. Never before have we had such a distinguished group of people come back and receive an honorary bachelor's degree and um, come back to join us in such large numbers during this year of celebrating 175 years as a university. So it's a, it's a real joy to meet you, the graduates of the three founding colleges. And we hope that you won't rush away but stop afterwards 
on what is called the Rector's Lawn, and we'll have tea together and catch up on some of the stories that we should have caught up perhaps many years ago. We'd love to hear those stories, and if I had my way, I'd have each of you come on a separate day and to tell me the story of your journey to, uh, to how we became a university. And so we think together about our history today. None of us were here 175 years ago, but the founding college was established in 1844, what came to be known as St. Catharines. 1856, Mount Pleasant and the Notre Dame College. And then 1964, Christ College. All these three end up not just in Liverpool, but they end up next to each other. And the story that God was writing becomes clearer as we look back. At the time, it probably didn't make much sense. Some of it was out of necessity. Some of it was out of freedom. But there was a hand writing the story of hope. And the story, or the river we call hope, has three important tributaries. St. Catherine's, Notre Dame, and Christ. In uh, the chapel, which I hope you'll visit, the, the ecumenical chapel across the road, which, we now, which is now the main chapel of the university, we have a large hanging in the middle of it, which was actually designed and, and prepared by the Pope's glass maker, who was a visiting professor in fine art here. He came to me after one of our Foundation Day services and said, Professor Pillay, this is a wonderfully new refurbished ceiling, but something is missing in the middle. And so he set about preparing that something missing. And I gave to him a text from Hebrews, which said, which a text you know well, I'm sure, that we are all running a race, but we're running this race not alone, we're running it before a cloud of witnesses. And I wanted the piece to be called a cloud of witnesses, because every time we gather in our chapel, we remember all of you remember the three colleges, the principals, the tutors that go back to 1844. And so we still gather with you in mind every time we meet in our chapel. And the cloud of witnesses reminds us on an ongoing basis where we came from and how we happen to be here now. My predecessor, couldn't stand those high walls that separated St. Catharines from Christ in Notre Dame. And so he pulled down the walls before I arrived 16 years ago now. He pulled down the walls and he exposed two ugly sides to each other because these sides were never meant to be seen by anyone walking down Taggart Avenue. The reason being that the front of St. Catharines faced Stand Park, and the front of Christ in Notre Dame faced Woolton. They pointed in opposite directions. And when he pulled down the walls, two sides became public. And so over these 10 years, we've been transforming the two sides into our center meeting place. It's now a green, with Taggart going through the green, and two buildings newly built, mirroring each other from across the road. And that greenery with a fountain is now, rather now houses what in New Zealand terms, where I come from, we call a whāroa. A whāroa is the opening to a Māori community. It doesn't have a gate. So we have an opening between campuses that doesn't have a gate. And in place of the walls is a whāroa, using the Māori term. And a whāroa is where the community meets and meets new people. And when you are greeted at the whāroa and you walk through the open arch, 
you become a member of the community. And so this living work of art celebrates the unity between the both, or rather all three colleges today. And here in Liverpool, in a place that was riddled by orange marches and all that you probably know better than I do, and in this city that could have easily had the troubles from across the ditch come here, in this city we have the only ecumenical foundation in higher education anywhere in Europe. The only ecumenical foundation that comprised, that underpins a university is here in Liverpool, and we are that foundation. And ladies and gentlemen, this is worth living for, struggling for, and dying for, because the cause of Christian unity in our time is as important as in those days of the Troubles. These three colleges probably never imagined being a university. I read the stories of Mary Lesher and Miss Allen and Father Bernard Doyle, and I've met two of them at least, or their successors, and I've listened to the stories of those days of difficulty. When government policy changes, like it still does, sometimes whimsically, sometimes policy written on the hoof, and we survive, and not just survive. Liverpool Hope, as you know, is outperforming much older and larger universities. Its research and teaching has, has received public acclaim, and each year we do even better, thank God. We now have, and I hope you'll take time to walk through our gardens, both here and the creative campus, to which you're always welcome to. We have some of the prettiest campuses you'll find anywhere in England. And that's because we believe that the quest for truth is also the quest for beauty and the quest for goodness. Truth, beauty, and goodness. And all our colleagues, all our staff today, work as hard as you did then to maintain a place that's beautiful, committed to goodness and to truth. But today we thought we must honor you because you walked before us. And after leaving here, you have gone on to do many, many things, not just in Liverpool, but across the country. If each teacher influences at least a hundred pupils each year, and I know you do influence many more than a hundred, but if each pupil, if each staff member influences a hundred students, and somebody works for 40 years in education, then directly you would have affected about 4,000. We have 600 here today, and 400 who couldn't be with us. That's just a thousand who responded to our invitation. 4,000 times 1,000, you can work that out, is 4 million. <laughs> 4 million people influenced through years of service. And each of, if each of our students had three or four in their families, that's 16 million. And just think what your graduates have gone to do, what your students have gone on to do, not just in England, but all over the world. This group, you, have affected millions of people. Just think about that. And your teachers that served on this staff in those years have, through you, vicariously changed the nation. One in every four in England have gone to a church school. And in the North, 41% have gone to a church school. The church was always first on the scene. In 1844, when our first college was established, there were only six universities in England. Only six, two of them medieval. None of them accepted women, none of them accepted Jews, and none of them accepted Catholics. 
our founding colleges created the first opportunities for women beyond high school in this part of England. The church was always first on the scene because it only dawns on the English consciousness in 1832 that the children of working class families should be educated at all. 1832, that is a dozen years before our first college. So ladies and gentlemen, we are part of a wonderful, important history. And we have served not just Christians, we serve the entire society. And this university is committed to that same vision 175 years later. If we do our work well, if we are gold standard research and teaching, if we do our scholarship well, and if we open our doors to everybody, we would in some senses be subversive. We'll undermine the hierarchies of privileges we create in the country, and everybody, every parent, child, will get a chance to achieve what God wants them to achieve. Although I came here from New Zealand, I grew up in South Africa. And I grew up in the terrible days of apartheid and not being on the right side of the color fence, I too was disenfranchised for much of my life. It was only in my 40s that I voted for the first time in my own life because Mr. Mandela became president. And in 1994, as recently as that, I had the chance to cast my first vote. And Mr. Mandela was more than just um, a prisoner, as you know, 27 years in prison. And Mr. Mandela went to prison, and the first thing he did was register through my university, where I was then a professor in Pretoria, the University of South Africa, to do his law degree. And he said to all his fellow prisoners on Robben Island, that in order to prepare for the future, and he knew that he'll never come out, was not supposed to come out, that in order to prepare for the future, we must be educated. And so he studied his law degree through my university. The government didn't allow him to, um, to receive his degree when he passed it. But when he was released from prison in 1990, he came to the university, and I was part of the welcome party serving on the Senate and the Council to actually welcome this great man. In prison, he got them all to register and study all his fellow prisoners. But he also got his white jailer, Christopher. His jailer, he said to his jailer, who he became friends with, why he should send his children to university to study. Because he said, education is liberation. Education is liberation. I had a chance to shake the great man's hand. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, in my short lifetime, I've seen the prisoner become president. I've seen people disenfranchised, able to reach heights in their societies because of a good education. And we, as a church foundation, have the obligation, as our founding colleges had in 1844 and 1856, to pull down the barriers that stop anybody reaching what God intended them to reach. And that obligation will remain ours. So you join us on an important, on an important birthday of the university, now you're not just graduates of one of our colleges. After today, whether you're St. Catharines or Notre Dame or Christ, after today, you're alumni of Liverpool Hope University. You are part of this university because you helped make it. Welcome home. Thank you.
Music is the, at the heart of Liverpool Hope. We have a wonderful musical tradition here. We have great orchestras and choirs, one of whom you will hear later in the ceremony. But one of the other things we do extremely well, if I might be so bold, is to train teachers of music. So we have this afternoon one of our own graduates, his, who is now the head of music at the Wirral Grammar School for Boys, Kevin McCaig. And he has brought some of their pupils with them to sing to you. They're going to sing Hymn by Sam Smith, which is conducted by one of their pupils, Ben Frampton. So we're really grateful to our partner school, we're all Grammar School for Boys, for sharing that with us. I think they were wonderful. You're all here this afternoon as graduates of one of our former colleges. You left this place with certificates of education or us in our days at college. On this special day, let our festivities be a toast in honour and thanksgiving for those who had a part in our lives in the colleges which today now form Liverpool Hope University.
Hello everybody, my name is Eleanor Jones and I am a fourth year primary teaching student here at Hope who is very nervous right now speaking to so many of you, so please bear with me. It is lovely to be invited to speak here this afternoon to celebrate the history of the university. Just next week, I am graduating as a Hope teacher and I am excited to be starting my career in September as a newly qualified teacher at a wonderful primary school teaching year one. The past four years of my degree have gone so quickly and I can't believe that my time as a student is over. I have been lucky enough to have some amazing experiences and make some wonderful friends. Just one of my highlights in particular was travelling to Norway just last year as part of a short international placement to experience our education system and approaches to learning. Another highlight has been the placement opportunities that I have had each year in a variety of schools across different year groups, from early years to upper key stage two. The university has helped me to develop my resilience and confidence as they have always been really supportive, particularly the tutors. During my time here, I have learned so much that I will be able to take with me into my first year of teaching and beyond to help me to be the best teacher I can be. Four years ago, I was interviewed here as part of the application process to be offered a place on the course. I was asked to interview what I think makes a hope teacher and my positive experience at university has helped me to further develop my thoughts on the qualities a hope teacher has. Hope teachers create awe and wonder in engaging classrooms. They help the pupils question in a safe, respectful environment. They encourage them to be ambitious and critical. They help them to apologise and really mean it. They inspire them to write and nurture their creativity and imagination. They encourage them to read for pleasure. They teach them how to spell those tricky words such as definitely, beautiful and necessary. <laughs> they model how to show all their working out in maths and edit it on their final drafts in English. They help them to understand others and understand themselves. They are inclusive of all and help everyone to celebrate achievements. So in short, Teachers make a world of difference that has a lifetime impact on pupils. And I know as a hope teacher that during your careers, you have too. Thank you for listening. As I mentioned earlier, we are very, very proud of our musical tradition at Hope. Part of our endeavour to educate students in the light of truth, beauty and goodness includes the commitment to a grounding in the arts and music is at the heart of this vision. I'm proud to introduce one of the university's excellent singing ensembles, Voices of Hope. They're going to sing Rest by Ralph Vaughan Williams and the madrigal Never Weather Beaten Sail by Thomas Campion.
Until the morning, the morning of eternity, the shall not begin, no. She waits, she will not be We need to acknowledge that Voices of Hope are overseen by our own Professor Stephen Pratt, who is one of you. So he is one of the alumni of our original colleges and he's still here working with our students today and we are very grateful to him for his hard work with Voices of Hope. We have many wonderful graduates from Hope and its founding colleges, and every one of them, and you, is very special to us. Sometimes a Hope graduate does something particularly extraordinary, 
and we recognise that at our graduations in the cathedral with the award of an honorary degree. Such is the case with our special guest this afternoon, Sir Christopher Stone. Sir Christopher received an honorary doctorate of education last summer, and he is a great friend of the university. It's my pleasure to invite him to speak to you, Sir Chris. Wow, what a great day, what a lovely day, and what a lovely event, so far, anyway. It's um, doubly special for me, as Kate and I got married here 38 years ago to the day in St. Catherine's Chapel. So, thank you. I can assure you that it's her that needs the clap, not me. Um, it is lovely to look out at the honorary degree recipients today. You really deserve this. You are the best. You are the best of teachers, and there was never any doubt that you were the best amongst us. The cert ed teachers always knew how to teach, how to deal with children. They just had it. They just knew what they were doing. There was always an unwritten acknowledgement that you were and would always make the very best teachers. And this recognition is long overdue. Congratulations to you. We were fortunate. Yeah, you deserve that. Thank you. I think we were really fortunate to attend Notre Dame, Christ, and St. Catherine's Colleges. The colleges suited us, and we suited them. The vast majority of us were from working class homes and middle class homes. We were happy and at ease here. Often, we were the first in our families to go to college and now university. The values of our three colleges were very clear. The behavior, and the expectations were understood, although not always followed quite so diligently. The early days rivalry, maybe in the 70s, led to something far more cooperative during the 80s and from then on. The city, well, we were really fortunate to have fallen into Liverpool or chosen Liverpool. Again, it was a very student-friendly city, and the two Davids worked tirelessly to bring the different communities together. They worked hard to ensure that their behavior was an example to us all, and that people of different faiths, or maybe none, could live together harmoniously to ensure that we brought the best out of ourselves although the blue and red shirts would always find that coming together a little bit more of a challenge. The lecturers, well, they were just normal people. They were caring, they were thoughtful. They understood, for many of us, that it was difficult. Like Eleanor and Irene so eloquently explained, the rules were really quite different, and we had to learn them. And the lecturers helped us with that. They were good people. They had good hearts, and they had our best interests at heart. People like Colin Lever, Fred Hurst, wonderful people, like Mike Seddon, and that socialist scouser, Jeff Leyland, to name but a few. They cared for us, and actually, they loved us. Sometimes we weren't always as lovable as we might be, but they did, and they were good people. We had field trips. We went to Dorset. We went to Cardian. We went to the Lake District. We had teaching practices that took us all over, Scotty Road, Toxteth, Anfield, and sometimes the Lake District. They were good times, 
But fellow students, you made the difference. You made the difference to us, the chemistry that was there. What you brought helped each of us to find out who we were truly going to be. Exactly as Nelson Mandela said, education sets you free. And you have done that to multitudes of children. You have made their lives better just by being you. Teachers often don't realize the difference they make to other people's lives. But the differences that you have made to so many people, countless people, exactly as Professor Pillay explained, is incredible. William Shakespeare talked a little about the seven ages of man. And they're about stages, and we understand stages of development. But actually, you can also put it into time slots as well. And more recently, I've been thinking about 20-year slots. The first 20 years really are very challenging. We know we deal with young people. I couldn't go back to doing that again. Those first 20 years, examinations, adolescence, they're tough. The second 20 years, well, you have children maybe, maybe you get married, maybe you don't, where you live, what sort of job you do, that's a difficult 20 years. The third 20 years actually don't seem to have been so difficult. I think, I mean, I, I remember my wife at the time, in the early 20s, was reasonably over to the feminist side of the line, and I remember her saying to me early on, Chris, you make all the big decisions. You make all the big decisions, I'll make all the small ones. And that came as a bit of a shock, because it didn't really fit in with what I thought Kate was about. Well, in that third quarter, that third 20 years, I've realized that I haven't actually yet made a decision. <laughs> it turns out that world peace, environmental issues, globalization, world hunger, Brexit, they're all the big decisions. They're left to me. Whether we had children or not, where we lived, what we did, they were her decisions. Now, most of us are moving into, not you, young lady, you're definitely in the first 20, but most of us are moving into that fourth quarter. And we have a decision to make. We can enter it and let it happen, or actually, like Nelson Mandela, who I too had the great fortune to meet once. And actually, I'll just tell you, when I, when I met him, before that, there'd been a group of people in Symphony Hall. And this African-Caribbean lady shouted from the, Nelson, Nelson, have you got a message for the black people of Ladypool? The black women of Ladypool? And all her friends around cheered and shouted. And Mr. Mandela said, yes, I do have a message for the black women of Ladypool but it's the same message for the white women of Ladypool and the same message for the brown women of Ladypool. And everybody stood up. He had that ability to unite. He did his great work in that last quarter. And so have people like Mahathir Mohamed, the 94-year-old president of Malaysia. And the queen, whether you're a royalist or not, matters not. You cannot but mark at the work ethic and the de dedication to duty. So I say to you, your best is still in front of you. <laughs> there is nothing that you cannot do. <laughs> there is nothing that you cannot do. All the things you wanted to do, you can do. Let's approach that fourth phase with excitement, with energy and hope. And I think that none of us would argue with the fact that we think it's lovely that our colleges have become known as Liverpool Hope University. What is more gratifying is that the leadership of the colleges, now as it was then, 
has been sustained and secured. The direction is still one surrounding the belief that love and service to others is at the heart of everything that it does. That the leaders should pull us all together today to celebrate in this way is testament to that. And I think we should thank them for that. Thank you very much indeed. And as educators, I leave you with a very short poem by Professor Jonathan Janssen, a South African educationalist. It's as if we mirrored our speech here. What are the broader purposes of education? To, to create a deeper sense of what is worth in the 21st century, a deeper humanity. In pursuing this endeavor, you need soul, suffering, and above all, hope. I am so very pleased that we do have hope. Thank you. I'm also proud that we have Sir Chris's wife, Kate, here today, who is another of our graduates. As Sir Chris told you, they met here, they married here, and today is their wedding anniversary. So I'd like to invite Kate up onto the platform where we have a small gift for you. We launched our 175-year celebrations at our Foundation Day service in January. One of the moments of joy was when we lit the Hope Candle, and our international partners across the world lit a version of the candle at the same time. In the chapel, we watched candles of hope being lit across the world. It was a very moving moment. As a mark of another significant moment in 175 years, we're going to relight the candle this afternoon. So I'm going to invite our chaplain, Mary Therese Lacey, to light the candle with the assistance of our youngest student, Eleanor. As our ceremony is coming to an end, I'd like to invite you all to join us for refreshments on the lawn, providing the rain has held off. You'll also be able to collect your certificate on the lawn as well. I hope that you've enjoyed learning a little bit about the wonderful university of which you are now a new graduate, and also that you've had the opportunity to meet old friends and to make new ones. Please stay in touch with us. This is your university. Please will you now stand to join us in singing the national anthem and for the chaplain to close proceedings with a prayer.
Let's pray. Lord be with you. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down on us and remain with us forever. Go in the peace of Christ. Thank you.